I thought I missed all the benefits of having a good time, so I went after all the gusto that I could handle. Gusto brought countless days and nights spent praying to the porcelain altar, smashed fingers in car doors and fights with my wife and family. All this, just to escape responsibility. As I continued to become more insecure with my actions and attitude, I went even deeper into the bottle. I felt as though there was something horrible always ready to happen to me. 116. Why me? Why not me? 117. I was seemingly satisfied with my alcohol use, and only occasionally thought of drugs. I still thought about the wonderful treatment that I received at the hospital, and occasionally fantasized myself back there being a wonderful patient. For a period of six years, I had been unable to laugh and enjoy living. I was just a miserable human shell. My attitudes were negative, and I had started to suffer physically, acting out my fantasies, and looking for sympathy. Recalling the thought of my treatment in the hospital, I was impelled to seek medical help for my ailment. I had developed stomach ulcers, due to what I thought was a bad diet and a very demanding job. I had begun to have problems with my knees, because I seemed to fall down a lot. After playing a good con on the doctor, I was finally hospitalized for tests. This was the beginning of the end. I had been able to convince the doctors that I was suffering from incurable and painful diseases. When I was released from the hospital, I was given prescriptions for various kinds of narcotics and downers to help me eliminate my suffering. I continued drinking alcohol while I took drugs. I became such an excellent patient that I was hospitalized 23 times in 4 years. During this time, I had surgery after surgery. I even had my stomach removed. All these surgeries ensured my drug supply. I was becoming a physical, mental, and spiritual mess. The constant conflict inside of me was more than I could deal with. With an ever-increasing amount of narcotics, I was able to function as a human being. I would even convince my children to watch their dad use a needle with his medicine, so that they would not fear the needle when it was their turn to get medicine. In the fall of 1979, I had an accident at work, where my hand was caught in a machine. As it happened, I looked at the machine operator and told him, it's a good thing I'm on drugs, or I'd be very mad. Nothing that was happening to me made any difference, as long as I was taking my medicine. I had no idea that I might have a problem with drugs. Many times, I thought that I might be taking too many, but I never thought I would have any problem quitting whenever the pain was gone. I was getting drugs from the drugstore and writing my own scripts at an alarming rate. It was quite a job to record and keep track of all the drugstores I'd used every day. There were times when I'd wish that I would get caught, so I could end the existence I was experiencing. Three days after my discharge from the hospital for my accident at work, my wish came true. In desperation, I tried to pass a bad script that I had written with my hand in a cap. I can't describe the fear that I felt when the druggist made her phone call. Before I knew what was happening, I was in serious trouble. 118 Narcotics Anonymous I considered running, suicide, insanity, anything to help me get out of this jam. 
I recall the thoughts that I had as I was talking to the police. They were the same thoughts that I'd had many times. Perhaps I could act very innocent and naive. After all this was my first offense. I made a plea to see my doctor. The police could see that I was terrified, and hurting as any drug addict hurts when he can't get drugs. I was told to see the doctor and get help. I instantly thought that I could get over on the law, if they saw that I was serious about getting help. Through the doctor and other friends, I was sent to a drug rehabilitation center back in my home state. This was going to be my ticket out of trouble. I just had to comply with their program, and that's all the law would need to drop charges against me. I went to rehab, knowing that I took too many drugs. While I was doing my time, I was asked questions like, Do you think you're an addict? Do you think you may have a problem with alcohol? How do you deal with anger? I answered these questions with, Possibly, no, I've never been angry a day in my life. I knew that I was in trouble when they diagnosed me as a pathological liar. I had many problems facing me when I got out of rehab. The law didn't go away and my wife was very bitter about my activities. My job was on the line because of my inability to function at work, and I didn't have very much money to pay my bills. Many things were happening to me, and I didn't know what to do. The rehabilitation center gave me some tools and knowledge about my drug addiction. I then needed tools to cope with the things that were happening in my life. One of the things that I was told to do in the rehabilitation center was to go to NA meetings, 90 meetings in 90 days. I didn't know what to expect, but I would try them anyway. What did I have to lose? The court also gave me their version of an aftercare plan. It was to attend a meeting every day for 365 days. It was easy to comply with their plan. If I didn't comply, I would go to jail for 7 to 10 years. I was resigned to the fact that I was going to be going to meetings for a while, so I thought I may as well make the best of them. I did the things that were suggested. Now I was going to be clean and serene. Wrong. Thank God I stayed clean, but in the last two years, my serenity has been interrupted on many occasions. After one year clean, my wife just couldn't understand why I was still going to meetings every day, leaving her and the children alone so much. Why me? Why not me? 119. When I told her that I planned to attend meetings of Narcotics Anonymous, even after my sentence was fulfilled, she just went absolutely off-center, making sure that I knew she didn't like that at all. I had picked a sponsor by now, and I was constantly crying to him with my problems. He told me to say the serenity prayer. I couldn't believe that he would tell me something so idiotic. How could that help my situation? I was being very negative in all situations in my life. I was told to work the 12 steps of recovery of NA. One thing I had to do was to come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I had known all along that I was powerless over my addiction, and that my life was unmanageable, but I just didn't have the faith that I needed to be restored. The next few months were very tough for me. I got divorced. When I was able to look at the entire scope of my relationship with my wife, I found that we were married for all of the wrong reasons. 
I had never known what true love or true caring was all about. I was totally selfish in all of my relationships. I was hurt. My ego had been crushed. I was humiliated. I have come to believe that humiliation is nothing more than being humbled against my own will. With this major trauma in my life, I found a power greater than myself. I found, through the fellowship of N.A., that I could either be very miserable with my situation or I could accept it and carry on. All these words still didn't stop the hurt. What finally stopped the hurt and pain that I was feeling was the suggestion that I get active in the fellowship of N.A. I started service work with picking up ash trays. Now I am able to serve the people who saved my life in various ways. One thing that was given to me from the beginning was the phrase, keep coming back, it works. Thank God for N.A. Since that time, I have tried to be a little more caring and loving when I deal with people. The first relationship I had with another addict made me see even more how much of my pride, ego, self-centeredness, and lack of faith I still have. The program of NA is a new way of life for me, and it is taking me a long time to learn how to live. You see, I'm as close to death as the person coming off the street, after one day clean. All I have to do is take any form of drug and I'm dead. Today, I am experiencing a freedom that I have never had. This freedom is the idea that no matter what happens to me today, God and I can handle it if I don't use drugs. Sometimes I still want to be a little crazy, especially where women are concerned, but it is getting better. 120 Narcotics Anonymous Jails, Institutions, and Recovery I first came to Narcotics Anonymous in a state prison. It was my third term. In prison over a seven-year period, with only a few months at any one time in the street. One night in this prison I heard of a meeting going on about something to do with drugs. Well, I could relate to this, so I decided to check it out. Besides, it would get me away from the cell for a while. I can remember how confused I was leaving the first meeting. Back in my cell, I dwelled on all those years in and out of jails and all the things that I'd been through just to get loaded. Most of all, I began thinking of how tired I was of living this kind of life. This group called Narcotics Anonymous seemed then to be a little too much for me. I told myself that I wasn't a hardcore dope fiend, but just a guy who liked to get loaded every day and a thief who could not stay out of jail. Although in those first meetings I did not see N.A. as a solution to my craziness, I did hear some things I could relate to. So, I kept going back. I heard the people in N.A. say that they didn't take drugs anymore, not even grass. I listened. Sure I wanted to stop all the insane situations in my life, but I didn't think I had to give up drugs altogether to do it. I thought that I needed to learn how to handle drugs better. Some of the N.A. members, who came into the prison to share at these meetings, had been inmates themselves. They attributed the change in their lives to the support of Narcotics Anonymous, one addict sharing and helping another addict. I enjoyed hearing these people tell how it was and how it is today and soon felt a real kinship in the pain that we had all been through. I began respecting these people in N.A. who talked about how they found a way to live without drugs, alcohol, and jail. 
I continued to get stoned in the institution whenever and whatever way I could while still attending NA meetings regularly. The members told me to keep coming back no matter what, so I did. Besides, it sure be talking that talk in the yard. 120. Jails, Institution, and Recovery 121. Soon I was to be transferred for pre-release to a much looser security prison. I had been there before and had been busted for smoking grass, for which I was sent to a more maximum prison. Now, as I was packing my property for this transfer, I remembered a lot of trouble I had gotten into at this institution, just to use drugs. The man knew me there, and I was pretty nervous now, thinking about being eyeballed from the time I stepped off that bus. I was already thinking hard about getting loaded when I couldn't scared stiff inside knowing what would happen if I got caught again. So I smoked a joint that morning before the long bus ride. I didn't know it then, but it was to be my last. Back in the beginning, when I was attending these NA meetings, I would wonder why it wasn't working for me like it did for others. I was tired of this drug and institutional life, but at that point I guess I wasn't tired enough, because I was still using when I was going to the meeting. I had a decision to make on that bus ride which was paid for by the Department of Corrections. The decision I made that day was mostly out of fear and some things I heard in those first NA meetings. I remember being in that bus, moving down the highway with chains wrapped around my waist and shackles on my feet, uncomfortably looking up at a resentful guard behind a cage with a shotgun. Staring out the window as the miles of freedom passed me by, I wondered why I couldn't be a part of that world. Getting loaded did not feel right anymore. Yet thinking about not taking anything sure felt strange. What a relief, when later I learned that it was easier by doing it just one day at a time. Upon arrival at this other prison I was met by an inmate who was an NA member. I knew him from meetings that we both attended at another prison. It really made a difference to see his face when I drove up because, again, I knew I had the support that would help me make it. I continued in the fellowship at this prison and became active in the service part of the program in the institution. During these last six months I had to do on my sentence, I would wake up in the morning and say, just for today, I won't take anything, and I hung with NA people in the institution to keep myself away from temptation. There were plenty of opportunities, so it wasn't easy, but I now had the support of the NA Fellowship. Once I was let out to attend an outside meeting, which made me want the fellowship on the outside even more. I started going to the meeting scene for the first time and something happened. The program began to work. 122 Narcotics Anonymous Today I know what makes NA work. One really starts understanding why it can work only when totally abstaining from all mind-altering chemicals. I also was beginning to understand what caring means, by helping each other, we can make it. I felt that the only one who really understood me was another addict. And the only one who could help was a clean addict. I was so proud to stand before the group in prison and announce that I had 90 days clean. Feeling proud was not part of my life before NA. It was such a relief, not having to hustle drugs out on the yard, and do the crazy things that I did to get high.
I had never done time like this and it sure felt great. I made another decision through the advice the NA members gave me, which was the second most important decision I had ever made in my life. This decision was to have someone from the NA program at the gate to pick me up when I was released. A person that I knew understood what I needed my first day out, because I sure didn't at this point. When I go back into prisons today to carry the message of Narcotics Anonymous, I suggest that inmates have an NA member at that gate when they get out. I heard so many say, oh, I'll check it out, but I gotta do this first, or be here first. Don't kid yourself, you might die first if you are an addict like me. That first day out was so righteous. I was taken to a home where NA members were expecting me. This one member gave me a new address book with NA phone numbers in it and said, Give me your old address book, you don't need those old numbers of your connections anymore. Another member took me to his closet, and gave me some clothes. I went to a bunch of meetings that day, and sure received the love and care I needed, which seemed to make up for all the attention I missed while locked up over the years. Recently, one of the many benefits, for me, was being able to stand before the judge of the Superior Court and receive my Certificate of Rehabilitation. I never thought I would be standing in front of any judge for this reason. I am so grateful today to say that I have been able to go beyond the fellowship for the support I need. I'm speaking about God. I mean a God I can understand and talk to when I need a higher strength, the God I found in Narcotics Anonymous. So, if you are in a cell reading this, my message goes to you. If you are wondering whether drugs are booze, or both are screwing up your life, find out where an NA meeting is in your facility and check it out. You might be saving your own life, and learning a better way. If one addict can make it, so can another. We help each other in Narcotics Anonymous. Fearful Mother 123 Fearful Mother I thought an addict was a person who was using hard drugs, someone who was on the streets or in jail. My pattern was different, I got my drugs from a doctor. I knew something was wrong yet I tried to do right, at work, in my marriage and in raising my children. I really tried hard, I would be doing well and then I'd fail. It went on like this and each time it seemed like forever, it seemed like nothing would ever change. I wanted to be a good mother. I wanted to be a good wife. I wanted to be involved in society yet never felt a part of it. I went through years of telling my children, I'm sorry but this time it will be different. I went from one doctor to another asking for help. I went for counseling feeling everything will be alright now, but the inside was still saying, what is wrong? I was changing jobs, changing doctors, changing drugs, trying different books, religions and hair colors. I moved from one area to another, changed friends and moved furniture. I went on vacations and also remained hidden in my home, so many things through the years, constantly feeling, I'm wrong, I'm different, I'm a failure. When I had my first child I liked it when they knocked me out, I liked the feeling of the drugs they gave me. It was a feeling that whatever is going on around me, I don't know and I don't care, really. Through the years the tranquilizers gave me the feeling that nothing is really that important. Toward the end, 
things became so mixed up I was not sure what was and what was not important. I was shaking inside and out. Drugs would not help. I was still trying, but very little. I had quit work and was trying to go back but I couldn't. I would be on the couch afraid of everything. I was 103 pounds and had sores on my lips and in my nose. I had diabetes and shook so that I had a hard time putting a spoon to my mouth. I felt I was out to kill myself and people around me were out to hurt me. Physically and mentally I had a breakdown. I had just become a grandmother and I could not even communicate with a small child. I was almost a vegetable. I wanted to be a part of living but did not know how. Part of me said I'd be better off dead and part of me said there has to be a better way of living. 123. 124 Narcotics Anonymous. When I started on the program of N.A., there were a lot of people who suggested just everyday things for me to do, like eating, taking a bath, getting dressed, going for a walk, going to meetings. They told me, don't be afraid, we have all gone through this. I went to a lot of meetings for the years. One thing has stuck with me, one thing they said from the beginning, Betty, you can stop running and you can be whatever you want to be and do whatever you want to do. Since being on the program I have listened and watched many people and have seen them go through many ups and downs. I have used the teachings I felt were best for me. My work area has had to change and I have been going to school. I have had to relearn all the way back to the grammar school level. It has been slow for me but very rewarding. I also decided that I need to know me better before I can have a meaningful relationship with a man. I am learning to communicate with my daughter. I am trying many things which I wanted to do for years. I am able to remember many things that I had pushed out of my mind. I have found that Betty is not that big pile of nothing but is someone and something that I never really stop to look at or listen to. April 1st, will be my 5th NA birthday. How's that for April Fool's Day? I have been asked to update my story. This April 1st, will be my 10th year birthday. I think, where have I been and have I really grown? I know that I have gotten married. I would like to say I love my husband very dearly, and at times this is hard for me to say. Expressing a deep feeling for any person has been very hard for me. I have felt like it would be taken away, or that he would hurt me or laugh at me. That has happened at times, but I have still loved him and it has not been that big and crushing a deal. I am learning not to put him or myself on a pedestal. If I am expecting too much of him that means I had better look a little closer at myself. There are times when we can talk, and there are times it takes time before we can talk. How boring if we both thought alike and everything went smoothly or if we fought constantly. I still get feelings of running away from home, and maybe going back to the island or Michigan. I have been living in the same place for almost four years. I think that is a record for me. I am still moving furniture around. I love it and would like to put everything on rollers, it would be a lot easier. I still do not understand men. Every once in a while I tell my husband that I am a woman and I need to be taken to a movie or somewhere. I am learning to verbalize my needs to another person. I also go to the show alone. Once in a while. Written in 1981. Fearful Mother 125
I graduated from high school two years ago. I would love to graduate from college.